guys, welcome back to Medical Coding with Blue. Today's episode is all about the question, is medical coding going away? If you are brand new to my channel, welcome. I am Blue, I'm a medical coder. Okay, I get the question a lot. Uh, hey Blue, uh, I heard that artificial intelligence is going to be taking over for medical coding and there's not going to be any more jobs. Is that true? Or, hey Blue, uh, I heard that all of the work for medical coders is going to go overseas for cheaper labor and, you know, we're, we're going to be without a job. So is this true? So, all right, I'm going to address these today. All right. The short answer is no. Medical coding in the medical coding profession is not going anywhere. That's the short answer. Now to explain it is I'm going to go <laughs> first with the artificial intelligence. Yes, there is artificial intelligence out there. However, I will say this to have a program, a computer program that will literally read and comprehend and make sense and reason and rationale, uh, a provider's documentation that is not standard, right? That is not standard. That is not the same all the time because it, the provider is always going to be in a different mood every single day. Okay. And yes, while some, some providers document consistently, there are other providers that uh, their, their work is a passion. So they're going to document however they choose to that day. So there's going to be always a difference in how providers document and say things in the documentation is going to be different for every single provider and every single patient is unique. So when you bring all of those things in, you have to have literally a software system that can literally read the provider's minds. Now, the thing about artificial intelligence and any kind of software computer programs, yes, there has been strides in the electronic health record. There have been strides in the encoder and encoder software. If you don't know is like an electronic uh, code book. Basically you put in a few words and it takes you through a decision tree and then it gives you the code. So that way you don't have to look up codes in the book. It's good, but it's bad. You always want to continue to uh, stay familiar with your book. Just a little <laughs> side note there. But I will say, continuing on. With um, those things, yes, it has helped us because obviously with the invent of the, uh, of the encoder, it has speed up, it has sped up the process of coding. So that is good because like the more volume of encounters we get, you know, the encoder helps to get these codes out faster rather than having to sit there and flip and go through a book, you know, so that has helped us. Right. And of course, the sophistication of in the electronic health record has also assisted providers, uh, although sometimes if you ask them, <laughs> they will get very frustrated because some um, some some electronic health records are very frustrating for providers. And I see because I, I watch them get frustrated because they have to go through this convoluted process of trying to get their documentation in there. And it's very frustrating. And I get it, you know, uh, because it's, it's like, really, why do we have to go through all these steps? And why is this so complicated? But that's the, uh, the price of technology. All right. Uh, so if you're worried about, you know, all of this artificial intelligence, they have been saying this for over 10 years. Uh, they probably said this since the 80s <laughs> when computers first came out. Uh, oh, yeah, it's going to take over everything. I started in the industry over a decade myself. And like I said, if I had listened to them saying this, oh, yeah, artificial intelligence is going to be taken over and you're not going to have a job because the computers is going to take over again. Medical coding involves reasoning, it involves comprehension, it involves rationale, it involves a lot of human components that is needed uh, that a computer software program cannot provide. You know, computer software is only, in programming, is only as smart as you're telling it to be. It doesn't know all the minute details. Uh, when you take, for example, even the books, um, our, our diagnosis books, uh, have to be updated constantly because of changes in diagnoses or trying to drill down to more specific uh, diagnoses. So because of that, think about that. That's a book that has to get updated, let alone a computer software system that has to calculate all of these things and think of all of these things. So again, uh, to me, when people say, you know, oh, I'm worried about artificial intelligence, you're worried about something that shouldn't even really be worried about. Yes, 
uh, there are things that are going to change in the future, obviously. I mean, 50 years from now. I mean, <laughs> you know. Uh, but uh, when you think about those things, it's, it's thinking too far ahead into the future. And it's if, you're, if it's going to stop you from doing that, then it could potentially stop you from having a career. If I had to listen to that, there would be no medical coding with blue. I would not be here talking to you guys today if I had listened to that years ago. So before I continue, when you're getting information from folks and people are telling you things, it doesn't mean that you have to believe what you hear 100% of the time from every single person. Because there's gonna be people out there with their own um, objectives, right? And there's gonna be people out there with their own motives and agendas and all this other stuff. So you really don't know where that person is coming from and they may have their heart in the right place, right? Uh, but at the same time, you really need to get this information from reputable resources. They're going to tell you that, yes, there's going to be advances all the time in technology. But again, our human element is needed. This is why I always encourage my audience to make sure that you are thinking about you know all these things and that you are trying to learn critical thinking skills when you're going through these documentations so that you can make yourself a very highly valuable medical coder because that's what we need in the industry we need highly valuable high caliber medical coders in the industry we don't need people who are here to collect a check and go home oh i'm in it for the money and that's all no you're in the wrong field because at the end of the day we have patience to think about while we don't physically touch these patients, while we are, we are not even in the room with them, we have no, no part in their care, we have a part in their, their health information. That's where we come in. And if, you, if you're passionate about what you do and if you really care, you're gonna make sure that all of the procedures are, are selected appropriately, all the diagnoses are selected appropriately because these things are carried through with these patients as they take their records from place to place or their electronic records is sent to the next provider. So because of that, it's, it's important to have people who take pride in their work not just somebody who's there to collect a check and go home. And I know that I'm a small voice saying that in a big pond, right? <laughs> but it, it, whatever your motives are, think about how you would like to have your medical record touched. Would you like to have your medical record uh, gone through and coded by somebody who doesn't care, who is just there to collect a check and go home and whatever the provider selected is what they're gonna pick? Or would you rather somebody who says, I'm gonna take a look at this I'm going to make sure this is right. Oh, okay. Well, this is missing here. I don't see this. I'm going to make sure that we get this uh, clarified here. I'm going to send a query. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to I'm gonna adjust this code because this code is not applicable here. It's this other code. Wouldn't you rather have that? So something to think about, guys. If you're considering this field, this field is a very serious field. And I hope that people take it seriously because, again, it's, 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 it touches so many people <laughs> and it does so much. It's, it's, it's a whole industry all by itself, health information, all right? <laughs> uh, but don't worry about artificial intelligence, okay, guys? Uh, to me, that's my opinion. Okay, I will say that. It's my, it's my opinion. Don't worry about it because if you're going to let that stop you, then you're going to let everything stop you from every single industry because there's always going to be something said about every single industry. Just saying. And the other half of this is, uh, oh yeah, um, it's gonna be sent overseas for cheaper labor. Well, here's the thing. Uh, sometimes this does happen, yes. But here's the thing. If we as English speakers have a hard enough time, some of us have a hard enough time reading advanced medical documentation with all this uh, medical terminology, and we speak English, and these are English writers, can you imagine who somebody whose English is not their first language, what they go through when they have to interpret this stuff? So you get what you pay for basically when they're saying, oh, we're sending it over for cheaper labor. When this happens, and I've seen it happen to more than one company, I've seen it happen several times. They, You have somebody in the administrative office that thinks that they're clever enough to send this stuff to, oh, we're going to get cheaper labor. We're going to get people to look at this for a cheaper price. Okay, maybe you may get some encounters that get coded correctly because the provider selected the encounter and basically they're just auditing it. 
but then you're going to start to see there's going to be some errors and there's errors even with American coders. But again, when you send work overseas and there's the amount of errors that comes back, because we're all being honest here, there is errors. And because I've seen, uh, what was it? Uh, it was cardiac lead and lead poisoning was confused. Okay. This was a cardiac lead and lead poisoning. So lead and lead is spelled the same way. So when you think about that, and I've, I've heard of other horror stories myself. So there's plenty of things that can go wrong when you send work overseas. But the problem happens when it, when it goes overseas, they have to bring it back and they have to have American coders to look at it again and to say, oh, okay, well, and then they have to fix it. Well, by the time you, you pay somebody to relook at all of that stuff again, you've doubly or triply paid what you would have paid in the first place had it stayed here. So what ends up happening is a lot of those come back to the U.S. So there's and there's a lot of companies that refuse to have overseas workers for this reason, because there's a lot of things that happen, you know, when stuff gets sent overseas. So it's just like with the with the errors and, you know, not to I'm not saying anything bad about anybody, but I am saying that that is something that does happen quite frequently when you have people who who don't speak English looking at these records. It's just like uh, a few years ago when they had the banks, when the banks started sending all of their um, their uh, call center stuff overseas. And, you know, the people the people were saying, well, we can't understand what they're saying. So they had to bring it all back. So again, if that's something that is concerning you or worrying you, it shouldn't because at the end of the day, it's, it's here. And, and it is on us as, as the coders to really make sure that we are getting it and that we understand <laughs> what is happening in these records. Because to say, well, I only went to, uh, to school to get my certification and, and that's all, that is, is inexcusable when it comes to, okay, why don't you understand what you're reading? Yes, doctors get 10 plus years to understand and they get taught by some of the best minds in the world. And us, <laughs> us as medical coders, uh, we're often teaching ourselves, which is difficult. And it's, it's advanced work, but it's not impossible because I came into this field with no medical background at all. I wanted to be an attorney. So when you, when you look at somebody whose whole life was about the law and wanting to, to work with the law and study the law, going into medical, <laughs> it was complete, is a completely different thing. But I am a very driven and very uh, detailed and very studious person. So that helped me. And, and just because, you know, you may not have had that in the past, or maybe you only have your high school diploma, or maybe you only have a GED, that's okay too, because uh, you don't have to have a degree to be a medical coder, but you have to elevate your game when you are coming in with just a high school diploma or a GED, because it doesn't mean that you can't know just as much or if more than a degree holder. So um, just because people have degrees, it doesn't mean that they know or they have that advanced knowledge. Everybody in, in the health information field, it, when they have their credentials, is on level playing field. Okay, just because you have a credential or this credential or that credential, it doesn't make you better. It just means that you are, are credentialed and you can you are trained or you know how to work in the outpatient setting the inpatient setting or a combination of both with the CCS, which is why I call the CCS the gold standard of medical coding credentials, because there is no other credential like it. It is the one credential that says that you can code both inpatient and outpatient. So, uh, and that is with the American Health Information Management Association. So again, I have met brilliant coders with all types of uh, medical coding credentials, and a lot of them have one credential. So, you know, again, uh, having an alphabet after your name, it does not uh, mean that you, it means that either that you have experience and you've been around for a while and you've, you know, you've mastered the art of a few things, uh, or it means that you've been studious and you've been studying and uh, you may not have experience yet, uh, but you have studied in order to take that exam. So it's all the caliber of every medical coder is going to be different. And I will say this every single time. It is true. Because just because, again, uh, you are you have these credentials, it's it's the detail and it's how you are 
studying how you're pushing yourself continuously, not just when you're in school, but when you are, you know, in the real world and you're not accepting just, okay, this is the, this is what we, this is the codes that we select and this is what we do. And this is what you're going to follow. If you follow that, <laughs> that sort of mindset, you never know what that provider is missing out on. So you have to look at everything with a critical eye. You have to look at everything uniquely because every patient and every encounter is unique. So, you know, again, if you, if you really truly want to be in this field, you're going to care about your knowledge base. You're going to work on that. Um, you're not going to listen to other people when they say, oh yeah, it's going to go overseas or it's going to be uh, or taken over by artificial intelligence. Listening to other people who, again, have their different motives and agendas. And sometimes they're not even involved in medical coding. That's what, that's what shocks me the most. When I hear, oh yeah, my family member said this. And they said that about medical coding. And when I ask, are they a medical coder? The first thing, oh no, they, they do something else in medical or they, they, don't, they don't work in medical at all. So you're going to listen to somebody that's not even in our industry about what is happening in our industry. <laughs> There's plenty, plenty of, um, of, of uh, articles out there about our industry from reputable resources like AHIMA or AAPC. So there's a lot of industry talk, Actis. There's a lot of industry talk out there. And you can get this information, good information, solid information about, about how our industry is and how our industry is growing and what you can do to make yourself more sharper from these reputable resources. So again, don't listen to Facebook medical coding groups. No, no, no. Even if it is about medical coding, <laughs> there are, I'm sure, I'm sure there are some good Facebook medical coding groups that are supportive and good. But more often than not, med Facebook medical coding groups are negative. And I have heard from people who said, well, Blue, um, I just wanted to let you know that uh, I was in this Facebook medical coding group and I decided I don't want to do medical coding anymore. Uh, thank you and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, wait a second, hold on. What did you hear? And they're like, well, you know, they were saying that it's going away and da, 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 da. Really? You, you would let something like that stop you from having a future? You don't know why those people said that. You don't know, oh, well, you can't get a job. That's another thing too. They like to say, oh, you can't get a job. I have had many people on my channel. Uh, they're, they're, I have over <laughs> 10,000 subscribers on my channel. Thank you. And of these people, <laughs> I have people who write me all the time, brand new medical coders. This is their first time looking out for a job and they get a job. And, you know, I'm not saying this to be like, oh, yeah, well, you know, whatever. I'm telling you guys, this is the truth. This is the God honest truth. When you have people like every medical coder that went through this, that had these had the struggle in the beginning of trying to find their first job, brand new medical coders did it in the middle of a pandemic, right? And you would think, oh my gosh, how, how, you know, I mean, like literally, like when you're, when you're thinking about getting a job in medical coding, they want you to have experience before you work remotely. But this pandemic changed the rules a little bit. <laughs> It allowed people to start even brand new, brand new with no past experience at home. So our industry has adapted to that. And when you think about it, it's like, wow. So we have a pretty incredible industry, but you have to get around positive people because trust me, there's plenty of negative people out there and there's some jaded folks out there as well. And, and, being jaded happens. I mean, there's, there's people that, you know, they, they try to say, well, I've been applying everywhere for years and I haven't been able to get a job. What does their resume look like? What does their cover letter look like? Can they pass a background check? Can they pass a drug screen? It's, it's really all about looking at what you're bringing to the field. Can they pass the uh, assessment? Because a lot of times what happens is maybe the resume looks good, and then they give them an assessment and say, okay, we're going to see what you know, what your knowledge base is, and they can't pass the assessment at the job place. 
So that's always another reason why people are not getting hired. And sometimes people don't know because maybe the employer won't tell them either. So it's important to always stay on top of your studies. I talked about that the other day. Stay on top of your studies, even though uh, you've got your credential and you're out looking for a job, make sure you're still practicing looking up codes in the book, looking up procedures in the book. Go to free websites that have free subscriptions like justcoding.com. Uh, they've got access to free um, coding quizzes, all right? <laughs> and, you know, again, if you're interested, I have my Patreon channel. There's also quizzes that I make up on that Patreon channel. So I will leave all of my contact information in the description box below. But it's important that you guys take what you hear from folks with a grain of salt. If you are wanting to get into this field, don't listen to these naysayers. They're going to give you all this negative information. Do your research. Ask questions to experts, to people that know, that to the people that, that's not going to tell you, oh, this negative, that negative. Don't ask other students either because asking other students is like, it's like they know about as much as you do. <laughs> and when you're brand new, you haven't been out in the field yet, you guys are still learning together. So don't allow anybody's negative influence to influence you. This is why I tell you guys to be around positive people. You've got to stay around positive people because trust me, there's plenty of negative out there and you only get one rodeo. And however you choose to spend your rodeo is entirely up to you. And for me, I choose to spend it being productive, being here talking to you guys, doing what I love to do. Because like I said, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. And I've said that since the beginning of my channel, since the beginning. And I feel like what I do now is not even work. This isn't work. When I, when I talk to you guys, it's not work either. When I go to work, it's not work. This is what I love to do. So I'm going to wrap this one up. Thank you guys for joining me. And uh, if you haven't hit that subscribe button, please hit that subscribe button. Like this. Share this if it helped you. And I will see y'all for tomorrow for Q&A Tuesday. Bye.